Linda knows what we are going to talk about today. Here is characters number one, one and two. Here is number two. Right? Number three. Number four. Alright. Six. You see all the genres that I'm invoking. The portrait, the genre painting, the still life with the second one. Now, and here is then the kind of royal portrait. Okay. It's not a terrific slide. It could be a lot better. The painting is, I tell you, a lot more beautiful. Okay. So this is on the side of Velasquez. Now we have Rembrandt. Okay. Here's Rembrandt number one. Here's Rembrandt number two. Here's number three, number four, and there is another one coming, but all this is only for uh, this is for next week, basically. Number five, okay. Now, I, now in the reversed order. This one. Yes. Mm -hmm. This his most horrible painting. <laughs> this is a, quite an amazing piece. And, Oh, it's, oh, no, don't insult my Rembrandt. No, this is a lot better painted. The painting, the paint is a lot more interesting, but it, the violence and the turbulence and the Baroqueness is, is women's like, that's true. Okay, this is a Tobias. There will be a Tobias drawing that's more important. This self-portrait we will dwell upon. And this is Gael killing Cicera. One of my favorite Bible stories. <laughs> Don't know why. And this is the one that we will talk about today. And this is the other one we will talk about today. So okay, I'm going to take off to take out the others. Okay, these are the two. Now just a set of characters for the Velasquez. Now, why do I put this one and this one separately, and I say these are two characters? Because the one is a pose, is a portrait of someone in, in his, with his dignity. He has this cross that stands for some honorary thing. And the other one is just a portrait of the face. It's all different genres, that's what I'm saying. Here's the still life. Here's the portrait. Maybe we'll keep the portrait somehow. Yeah, okay. What happens? I don't... I'm not sure this is what I want to do. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to give you a few of these lights. Okay. We can have some light for some time. Now, this session and the next is going to be about self-reflection. And that involves a lot of things that we haven't done today, uh, t until today, okay? And the things will come up, but it's, it's really trying to pull together a number of considerations. Now, I told the students to read articles that you faculty members won't have read. So feel free to ask some clarification if, if it's too detailed on the papers and if the quotation is not clear enough. But because this is the first time that there may be a discrepancy if you don't, if you didn't read the, the material. Now, Svetlana Alpert, there is a, the background of this is, or the occasion for these two sessions is this whole debate on Les Meninas. But obviously that is not the reason. That is just the material that I'm jumping onto because it fits so nicely. Svetlana Alpert, one of the participants in the debate, begins her article on Les Meninas with the following appraisal. Along with Vermeer's Art of Painting and Courbet's Studio, Velasquez's Las Meninas is surely one of the greatest representations of pictorial representation in all of Western painting. So it seems that we must turn to the Spanish masterpiece, which is in, in the museum, it's recommended as the masterpiece of universal painting. I mean, not only of the world, but even outside. So we must turn to this piece rather than to Rembrandt's work, who in spite of, uh, Rembrandt, who in spite of the abundancy of self-portraits, you know, that he has almost a hundred self-portraits, if you include the, the drawings, 
hardly ever represented painting or himself as a painter. The one little panel that you just saw, the artist in his studio in Boston, in the Museum of Fine Arts, one of his earliest paintings, and certainly not the of the category of masterpieces Albus refers to. I mean, I'm not trying to make the claim that this is as wonderful as Las Meninas. We don't talk about that kind of issues. Stands alone in the artist's oeuvre. It's the only one, as far as I know, that is on painting. Yet it is also it is to this little work, along with Las Meninas, that Leo Steinberg, author of one of the best pieces on Las Meninas, refers in his profound analysis of Picasso's lifelong obsession with uh, simultaneity, his effort to overcome the limits of perspective. You know that Cubism and and after Picasso's a lot of Picasso's work was attempt to represent simultaneously different perspectives. And here's the quote. Or else the foreground motive of, his, of a canvas in progress, as in Rembrandt's painter before the, his easel. That's a different title. It's the artist in his studio, but never mind. And in Velasquez's Las Meninas. In both pictures, this is Steinberg, in both pictures our attention turns on the glance of the painter. Behind the reverse of the canvas, we see its obverse observed. The modesty in size, this panel is this big. It's really tiny. The modesty in size and, th and the thematic simplicity of the Rembrandt compared to the proudly huge and insistently complex Velasquez seems, um, seems to make the evocation of the former in relation to the latter almost inappropriate. How would we compare those two works? It's ridiculous. The one is a, m a mature masterpiece and the other is a beginner beginner's work, and so there are a lot of reasons not to compare them. If it were not for the mode of reading we are invited to bring to both works, this mode of reading, which relates the work back to itself, is in a sense a continuation of the textual mode of reading that we talked about last time, which, as, an, as is immediately obvious, could be considered as one of its submodes. You could claim that reading for the text, as we have been doing last week, is a way of self reflective reading. As we have seen, the effect of the real its in its pursuit of unproblematic representation hits the resistance of the mode of reading which privile privileges textuality. That's how the two were in conflict. Only to a limited extent can the belief in the illus illusory transparency of realist art and fiction elude disturbing countersigns. Beyond that, a viewer reader, read or reader holding such a belief will be annoyed by the unlikeliness of the representation, for example. In some cases, you can get away with it, but in some other cases, you will just say, this is a bad painting, because it doesn't confirm the standards of realism. And sometimes, that the, the artist would get the blame for a lack of skill. Such a reaction is not likely to occur with the Bathsheba, because the distortion there doesn't strike immediately. The painting can accommodate both realist and textual pain, uh, readings. But it could easily happen for the Joseph etching, and in fact it has happened. He has been criticized for this impossible woman that is not like a real woman, hence it's a bad work. The viewer who is not ready to attribute the strangely distorted body of the woman to a narrative strategy will find the body oddly drawn. But whoever is responsive to the narrative strategy is forced to see how the collusion of the story of desired initiation and the story of fatherly jealousy makes the body make the body deviant from real bodies by depriving it of its wholeness. In addition, the awareness of narrative strategy entails awareness of representation as manipulation. And then here we get to the point where we can say that self-reflexive reading could be an, a tool for a critical attitude. Once the woman is seen as the product of the two men's imagination, then the fabula of the narrative itself is instantly modified. I will argue here in these two sessions that such reading, when pushed a little further, leads to reflection on the work itself and its work upon us. So then the notion of self-reflection <coughs> gets a double meaning. It's the reflection of the work on itself, but including the, the reader or the viewer. The effectively anti-realist reading strategy, favored in the postmodern era, you know that that is the fashion today to do this, is some sort of self-referential mode of reading, reading for the work itself, the mode which makes us read, to use Linda Hutchins term, for the narcissism in the work. And the term admittedly has its drawbacks, 
Linda warns us not to take it in a negative sense. Hence, the sense of self-closure and subsequent, de subsequent death is never far away. But it also illuminates the particular pictorial quality, you know, that the, the, the idea of narcissism is related to visuality and the erotic near gratification of self-reference. And those are the two aspects of the term. So although I can see the problems with the term, I would like to keep it because it has all these, these possibilities. And I want to reflect on those. The concept of narcissism will be used in these two sessions to bridge between the self-reflexive mode of reading and the problem of a psychoanalytic approach to painting, which then we will talk about in the sessions after that. But in order to allow for such a leap from pictorial self-reflection to psychoanalytic narcissism, the very idea of self-reflexive reading needs qualification. Self-reference is invading the arena of interpretation so pervasively today that it needs a little further specification. And the very success it has is suspect, and we will see how we can deal with that. The idea of self-reference is meant to be anti-realistic and critical, if not self-critical. And true enough, whenever detail is interpreted as referring to the work itself or aspects of it, it becomes a sign that, that counters smooth, transparent interpretation of the subject matter. Self-referential signs may therefore either escape or bother realist readers. Uh, but for those who are interested in the challenge, self-conscious works of art addressed to their views of the world, those works hold a clue for possible reflection of, on representation and its tension with the represented, and by extension, on the viewers or readers' own realist impulses and the background, the ideological background of that impulse. Self-reference, I claim, is the royal road to critique. One wants to examine, however, if such a reading strategy, excuse me, I am getting a little hot here, <laughs> if such a reading strategy might also tend to lead to a self-sufficient sense of triumph, a self-congratulatory pleasure of discovery, which would then not only cancel out the critique itself by the contradictory uh, pers persuasion that one has discovered the truth in painting, to quote Derrida's title, but also distract from historical and social issues. It is the mission of art to address it as well. So there, there's a, a danger there. To put it in yet another way, one self-reference as a possibility has become commonplace with the rise of postmodernism. The attraction of reading for narcissism, and I, I put the quotation marks as long as we haven't figured out what exactly we mean with the term, is in danger of becoming narcissistic. There is a kind of joy of the discovery, and then look what I discovered here. And you see what I mean, that, that, is, that can be very deceptive. It has become so strong and easy that while proposing it as a possible mode of reading, I feel uncomfortable just advocating it without qualifying its merits, its modes, and its limits. The accusation, so let's first get rid of a few of the objections. The accusation of ahistoricism of self-referentiality can be countered easily. Firstly, or in two, uh, two ways. Firstly, Linda Hutchins suggests in the preface to her book, Narcissistic Narrative, that the parodic effect of, and the intertextuality it, ent it entails seems to save us the trouble, seems, she doesn't say that that's what ha should happen, seems to save us the trouble of situating the work in history a reason for its attraction, but, as she rightly points out, also a reason for suspicion. If that is the effect of self-reflexive self reading, however, that is at least paradoxical, for it is precisely the intertextual reference that points at the work's historical position. Intertextual reference may point to the problematic relations between the work and its predecessors. It is not just a self-contained self-reference. On the contrary, it's what relates the work as work to be true, hence as not realistic. So it's, there's not a direct relation to history in a naive sense, but it relates the work to something else, and that something else, the other work, is historically positioned. And so the relation between the two works produces the diachronic perspective that positions the parodic work historically too. In other words, this kind of intertextuality poses its own historicality as well as the very question of historicism. 
because it's also playing with history. Secondly, self-reference should not be a conclusion, but a starting point of further specification. This becomes clear in the difference, for example, between Svetlana Alpes' uh, paper on Las Meninas and Searle's. The superiority of Alpes' piece is due to two features, the author's willingness to see more than one meaning in the painting, and in relation to that openness to ambiguity, her attempt to make the self-referential meaning historically meaningful. Her claim is that the work is paradox and looks paradoxical or is complex because it is addressing two modes of representation, the descriptive and the narrative modes. In other words, she avoids two stops to the interpretation that the hypothesis of self-reference sometimes seems to encourage. The stops brought forth by the illusion that saying this work is about itself is saying much. This is one reason why the odd comparison between the Velasquez and the Rembrandt does make some sense. With the simple conclusion that both are about painting, we are confronted to the poverty of this mode of reading if it is left unspecified. Precisely because there is this huge gap between the two works, it becomes quite ridiculous to just say, look, here we have two works on painting. Against the second related but not identical threat, the possible tendency of self-reflective reading to distract from the issues concerning the world, social reality, material reality, the obvious answer is to argue that such a tendency rests on a distinction, even an opposition, between work and world, which, is, which it is the mission of self-reflexivity to challenge. This is precisely why the concept is in need of specification. And in these two sessions, I will argue that among the modes of self-reflexivity with which the works are read, the more specific ones incorporate reflection on the relations between world and work, while the more global, non-specific ones tend to be used for an obliteration of those relations. In other words, like with all the other modes of reading, it can be used either way. You can use it in a very limitative sense and also in a sense that opens up. Self-reflexivity as a mode of reading has still another side or paradox to it, and it is this third problem that resolves the two others and that will be the focus of this presentation. It seems paradoxical that the mode tends to lead to the viewer interpreter, sorry, tends to lead the viewer interpreter to submit to a position perceived as determined by the work. As in a Hegelian master-slave dialectic, the viewer is so overwhelmed by the discovery of self-reflexivity that he or she tends to set his or her own position aside and submit totally to the position seemingly proposed by the work. And this entails a paradox as classical as the paradox of the Cretian liar. That is, if, if self-reflexivity is to make you reflect on relations between work and, and representation and the represented, then submitting to that is, in fact, cutting yourself off from self-reflection. Much of self-reflexivity, however, addresses the position of the viewer, and thus seems to define and circumscribe that position. But if reflection of or on the work entails reflection of or on the viewer, then any submissive response is paradoxically non-submissive. So trying to be a slave, you are, in fact, uh, refusing what's asked from you. It refuses to obey the indictment of reflection. So here's this, the paradox being that obedience contradicts itself. You're not asked to obey, but you, if you do what you're asked to do, you are obeying. And, the, and it is in this paradox, it is this paradox that subsumes the others, and that will be the starting point for uh, today's discussion and next week. It seems reasonable to take the subject of this part of this, this whole uh, part on, on self-reflection at its own words and to use as the verbal other not a pretext as we have done in the analysis of the Bathsheba for example or the Tobias not a post-text as the case of Thomas Bounds Joseph not a co-text as in Uncle Tom's Cabin but an intertext in a narrow and specific sense a critical text that interacts with a self-reflexive work and therefore I wanted to use as a starting point this discussion on Las Meninas. The debate makes such a good case because at the least in the articles of, uh, by Searle and Schneider and Cohen, there is a striking discrepancy 
between the positions of the uh, the critic sorry between the positions the critics argue on the rational argumentative level and those they reflect in their discourses in the sense of mirror in other words the critical texts lend themselves to the kind of specular and speculative reflexive reading that makes the mode of self-reflexive reading genuinely interesting. I'm going to play a lot on reflection, reflexive, in the way of the mirror and in the way of rational uh, reflection. Reading, but self-reflexively, the critical texts as the same kind of verbal visual texts as any other, as any other text evoked so far. I will draw from a first reading of Searle's article, the reflexive issues of the debate, and formulate them in terms of the problem of narcissistic representation. And then I take his text as a case of narcissistic representation. The second paper in the debate, Snyder and Cohen's, will confirm and strengthen in a very strong sense of repeat, almost in the Freudian sense of the compulsion to repeat, the central preoccupation of Searle's text which they set out to attack. And I'm sure that that's the level of the text that may have escaped you, that, that there is a kind of reflection between the two rather than the antagonism. Along the way, we will need to specify the concept of self-reflexivity, of course. And then at the end, at the end of next week, I will wind up with a re-examination in the light of the results of these analyses of the concept of narcissism as a label for this mode of reading, that is, after going through all these cases, I will argue that it does make a lot of sense to call this narcissistic reading, although that doesn't claim that narcissism is the goal of the reading. The question of Las Meninas is, in its simplest formulation, what is the position of the viewer in relation to the mirror representing the king and queen of Spain? And that's why I put that first in the first presentation. And in relation to the canvas, the represented painter is working on. There are two modes of self-reflection involved in this question, the mirror and the canvas. One would almost say the mirror and the lamp, which stand to each other as natural and cultural, or in a different vein, as narcissistic imaginary to symbolic. It is precisely this doubleness of the self-reflection which distinguishes this work, not only from the modest and relatively simple Rembrandt, and let me just show them one after another. Here is the one. Oh, I'm sorry. And here is the other. Now, there is a striking difference. Even. And also from the other, from its other more glorious rivals. But the two-fold self-reflection, let's go back to the... What happens here? Am I doing something wrong? Yes, I guess I do. The twofold self-reflection does not double up. So you see the, the canvas and the mirror, right? And one would almost think that there is also a sequence with the guy in the background, in the window, in the light, like a profile. There is another reflection there. So the twofold self-reflection does not double up, and the mismatch between the two, reflected in the troubling question that bothers the critics, what is on the canvas? that is the question, is precisely the locus of the problem. Hence there are two issues that tend to be conflated, their conflation being the third issue. The first key to the recent response to Las Meninas is the mirror in the middle of the painting. Why don't I try to pull it up quickly? I'm sure I won't manage. No, okay, I'll give up. Sorry. Get rid of this. Okay, I'll give up then. Unless it is right here. Yes, okay. Here we are. This is the mirror in the middle of the painting where the royal couple is represented. The question it is evokes is where are the royal intruders standing? In other words, what is reflected in this mirror? And what is the position of the viewer in relation to this reflection? Now, the first point, of course, is this is a mirror. How do we know? It could also be bad painting, right? Or impressionist painting. 
it poses the question, the very question of self-reflection. As represented in this mirror, the royal masters are strangely small. Now, let me try. Can I do it? Yes, I can. Are strangely small and clear and secondary to the scene depicted in this representation. Yet, as invisible but real, they are the focus of sustained attention from six out of nine characters and the source of the interruption of the narrative. And this is another important issue that hasn't been really developed in, the, in, the, in those pieces. The narrative of the peaceful work in the studio onto which they impose the rival narrative of their decisive displacement. They are coming in and being there in the mirror. There is, excuse me, there is no such diverting mirror presence in Rembrandt's panel at all. Okay. Um, no, not okay. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll see the Rembrandt in a minute. The second key, the one that brings in self-reflection in the other sense, is the painter's canvas, strangely huge, foregrounded, yes, yet displaced in a corner that makes it easy to overlook. And in fact, it has been overlooked during decades of intensive criticism. You can't believe this, but there has been a lot of work on this painting that don't mention the canvas. Or maybe mention it, but don't do anything with it. Just, it's just a ploy. We must realize that the real painting itself, on which this huge but not overlookable painting is represented, is equally huge. That is, the work as it is in the Museum of the Prado is enormous. This oversizedness is also obvious in Rembrandt's little panel. Here also the, the represented work is enormous, although here it does not match with the size, nor with the material, the work being painted on wood and not on canvas, of the framing work itself. That is strange in itself that he did this work on a panel. The disproportionate canvas conflates, so to speak, the functions of the mirror and the canvas in the Velasquez. Like the mirror, it stands in the place of the viewer, displaced, displaces the viewer's place. Like the canvas, it makes us reflect on what is reflected on its invisible side. We wonder what's there. Between the royal masters and the powerful servant in the Spanish painting, let me try, yes. There seems to be a competition. The painter, whose painterly talents define him as a Hegelian slave towards the masters, whose self-definition requires the, the slaves and slavely willingness to represent them. You see what I mean? He was in their service, and he had to do a representation of the royal pair. And he was, he was there, there for it, because royalty requires representation on a painting. But then, he becomes the master because they, their existence depends on depends on, on him. If he's not going to do a good job, he, they will go into history as he represented them, not as they really were. And he does execute himself, but not without representing them, including the master or slave dialectic, who the master slave dialectic through which both he and they are defined. That is, he he does portray them. And he portrays the fact that they are portrayed. But he includes this whole thing. And that's why I showed you the detail of his head. He really includes a portrait of a self-portrait. That's it. He is better portrayed. Portrayed, sorry. He's better portrayed than they are. The competition is enhanced by the tension between the two narratives, one of which, the work in the studio, is durative, hence poor as a narrative. There was something just going on. The other, punctual, hence supplying suspense. There is something coming in and the whole thing changes. In Rembrandt's work, the stillness of the pose contradicts the sense of narrative inherent in the idea of work. That is, you don't have, there is, there is a conflict. On the one hand, it's the painter at work, but he's not at work, he's standing there. It's a portrait to anticipate a little. We, the viewers, will have to work hard to make this work work as a narrative of work and of power. In contrast, the distribution of power is powerfully suspended, thus insisting on its presence in the Spanish work. And this suspension has to do with self-reflection, the mirror, and the critical response, as we will see. <laughs> 
Now the first moment of self-reflection is already inscribed in the locus of the debate on Las Meninas, that is, what is in the mirror. The revival of interest in Las Meninas is primarily occasioned by the fact that the philosopher, hence a professional self-reflector, Foucault, opens his study of the classical age with a 13-page long reflection on this painting. Searle, another philosopher, significantly a philosopher of language, hence a philosopher of verbality, takes the work as typically paradoxical. This term, I'm now just summarizing the, the debate, this term makes two other critics extremely angry and amuses others, and thus starts off the responses to both this representation, uh, to both this interpretation, representation of the painting by Snyder and Cohen on the one hand, and by Steinberg's on the other, by Steinberg on the other. Well, a few years later, Svetlana Alpes presents her own response obliquely in connection with these predecessors. The first three come out within a year, and then the fourth comes a few years later, and there is a significant gap between them in style. And the temporal relations between these responses have some relevance for the discussion and will be evoked in due course. I think it's an interesting consideration. Foucault's thesis is relatively simple. He takes the work to reflect the typically classical attitude toward pictorial representation. The painting represents the absence of the viewer, which is for Foucault the essence of classical representation, which is this idea of transparency. The absence is signified in the fact that the obvious place for the viewer, the mirror in the middle of the painting, if you have a mirror and you as a viewer stand opposite that mirror, you're supposed to be there but that mirror is occupied by someone else. This reading is based on the hypothesis of self-reflexivity in its double meaning of visual mirroring and discursive thinking. That these two meanings tend to be conflated, and you see that there is, this, there is the visual and, let's say, the verbal uh, self-reflection. That these two meanings tend to be conflated in the idea of self-reflection is maybe the most powerful aspect of the idea itself on the condition that they be self-reflexively self disentangled. It is that you realize, as a critic, what you are doing when you're addressing these issues. In contrast, at first sight, Rembrandt's little panel seems to signify the presence of the viewer. The tiny painter is not only looking out of the frame scene right into the viewer's eyes, but also ostentatively posing for the viewer. So who else would be pose? And then, of course, if you pose, there is a supposed painter, so the viewer becomes a painter, which makes it self-reflexive in the other sense. Yet the distance between the little man and the huge canvas and the angle of vision represented makes this line of vision ambiguous. It is hard for the viewer not to feel that the canvas is standing between him or her and the painter with a twofold effect. It becomes less certain that the painter is looking at us. The eyes are not clear enough, he's too far, and there's this thing in between, which he may be looking at too. And second, we realize that it is the work, not us, who makes the subject, the painter, visible. He is almost standing there as the subject of that painting. In other words, also mirrored, because you see him, the painting illuminates him. The light comes from the painting, in a way. Hence, both works make a place for the viewer only to un immediately undermine it. That is something they have in common. This basic insecurity is offered to the viewer as a proposal for self-reflection, and it is arguably the inability or unwillingness to expose oneself to it that this insecurity is overwritten in some of the critical texts. Hence, that is uh, in some of the critical texts, and I especially think of uh, Searle here. Hence the, displaced, the displacement in tone. Foucault's reading is also based on a paradox inherent in the hypothesis of self-reflection. By representing, let's go back to the last minute, because that's what he talked. No. Okay, this is not my fault. Okay, this was really not my fault. No, I know, but I don't trust this thing. But you tend always to trust the machine rather than the person. 
Foucault's reading is also based on a paradox inherent in the hypothesis of self-reflection. By representing the absence of the viewer, the work does represent the viewer, albeit negatively. Verbality, if I may continue to use this term, helps to see this. If visual representation has been assumed to be unable to represent syntactic connections, shifters, and negations, and the latter has proven the most resistance, the resistant of these three negative indicators of visuality. All three have been, of course, a uh, challenge. The typically verbal negation is visually represented in the work as a process. That is, if you, if you see the work as there is no place for the viewer because that place is taken, that is an explicit negation rather than, an, uh, than a bypassing of the viewer. Hence the first conclusion, by working for the negation, negation of the viewer, self-reflection turns the work verbal. And what we see is a discourse on representation. And that's why those philosophers are hooked by it. This meta-representational discourse triggers philosophical response to the work in a specular movement which repeats the work. That is then the philosopher who reflects on how this work reflects classical representation by this negation is, is mirrored by it. It also allows Foucault to use the painting to drive his point about classicism home. The painting becomes a philosophical text. But here he arrives at a first full stop. What characterizes Foucault's response is also the triumphant sense of understanding, of discovery, that is related to the unifying impulse of criticism. And hence the idea that when you have an explanation, you're all set. This pleasure of the one word that explains it all. Indeed, by taking up the aspect of the work that accommodates the sense of classical dogma, the philosopher has accomplished the unity of the work against all odds. This work is so ununified that there is a sense of triumph in accomplishing a unity. Both Alpers and Steinberg will respond to this aspect of the Foucauldian response and are thereby able to overcome its limitations. Significantly, they are both art historians with interdisciplinary interests, not philosophers. So, a fully fledged philo philosopher and not like Foucault, also a cultural historian, in a sense Foucault is a, an interdisciplinary figure and so is not, starts where Foucault ended and problematizes without really undermining it, the accomplished unity by introducing the typically ambivalent idea of paradox. So Searle's argument is this work is paradoxical because um, you must see yourself in that mirror, and you don't. Paradox is a tricky concept. It's like irony. It's really a tricky thing. It helps to overcome a naive sense of unity while still accommodating the problematic unity in an aufhebung that resolves the conflict. So first you say, no, this is not a unity, there's this side and that side. But then, luckily, we have the aufhebung and we have the paradox. In that sense, it is a modernist rather than a postmodernist concept. Here is how, at the end of his introductory uh, paragraph, so right in the beginning of his essay, so reformulates the question of the meaning of Las Meninas. At one level, the paper, the, the paper, this is a nice slip. At one level, the picture is about Margarita and her entourage. At another level, the picture is about two things, one of which lies outside the painting and the other of which is invisible. That is about the viewer and about what's on the canvas. It is important to note that Searle does not deny or, ignorant, or ignore the first level. That is, it's also simply a painting on this little princess and her entourage. Although we have to wait for Svetlana Alpers to integrate it in the whirlpool of self-reflexive meanings. She has, uh, she has a job for the idea that this is also a representation of the princess. Searle sets it aside. He mentions it, but then he brackets it and fails to take it up later. Why does he mention it in this paragraph if, he, if he's not going to do anything with it? If we take the sentence that I just quoted, visually, that is, as an iconic representation of the outlined project, there is an interesting syntactic structure here. While opening 
the, jun the opening up the unity, the distinction in two levels, which is a way of opening up the unity, assures that the subsequent distinction of the two things within the second level, the self-reflexive one, does not disturb the, the unity all within that level. See what I mean? By saying first, it's about this and about that. You say, okay, how nice, so we have two things. But then he only works in, within the second and keeps that together in the syntax. And that's exactly what his argument is going to do. Thus, thus the sentence accomplishes visually already what the rest of the argument sets out to do discursively. We place a naive and monolithic unity with a sophisticated dialectical unity. Because he's, uh, by structuring the sentence this way, you see what I mean? He sets an opposition. He says it's about one level and then about another level. And thus he puts the other level in a unity. Then he gets rid of the one, deals with the other one, and you know already that he will end up with a unity there. The syntax of the sentence predicts that. And to continue the dialectical parallel with Rembrandt's panel, here there are no characters other than the painting instead of the characters that I showed you of the one thing. I showed you other paintings, other works by Rembrandt. Here there are no characters, only the painting and the painter. But Searle's point can be formulated nevertheless in exactly the same way. On one level, we have a portrait. The painting is about Rembrandt, Margarita or Rembrandt. And on another level, it is about two things, one of which lies outside the work, the emphatically excluded pure, and the other which of which is invisible, too much inside the work, so to speak, the meaning of the represented work. It is imperative, if we wish to overcome Sorrel's limitations, to counter his two divisions, that is, to systematically, this is kind of a hermeneutics of suspicion. If he has this syntactic structure, let's just break through it and do the opposite. To interpret the first level in relation with the second, as authors will do, and to break up the implied unity of the second, as I will try to do. In other words, we will have to address the question what the portrait is doing in the narrative of painting, and what the irreducible difference is between the reference to the viewer and that to the invisible work. That is, that is not the same thing, although in the Velasquez argument that's, that tends to be the case. They may reflect each other, but they cannot be conflated. Searle then starts out developing his argument based on a theory of meaning which he develops out of a staggering number of assumptions. And I can't blame him because he's basing himself on a specific philosophy of language that with his reputation, he can expect readers to know. But if you just enumerate the assumption, it is staggering. He sees meaning as intentional with a T, right? And assumes that pictorial meaning is inherently, intentionally based on resemblance, second which in turn is contingent upon point of view. Here are three assumptions that are pretty strong and questionable. The modifier then slips in again in a syntactically interesting way. And this is systematic in, in, if you read source text. Is this, can you follow this if you don't have, if you haven't read the, the article? More or less? Okay, thanks. Now, I quote a sentence from Searle, and again, this is the sentence that we don't look as, at his argument as much as at his own text, as a literary text. And since the intentionality of pictures, at least within the conventions of classical pictorial representation, relies on resemblance between the picture and the object depicted, the form of intentionality that exists in pictorial representation is crucially dependent on point of view. This is how he links the three together, the three assumptions. Now, what I want to point out here in the in syntax of the sentence, it is highly paradoxical. It presents as a casual and self-evident pre-given, at least within the conventions of pictorial re uh, classical pictorial representations, that what is precisely the alleged object of self-reflection in the work and the scrutiny. So he, in fact, he doesn't have an argument and the argument is already stated as, as something that, of course, that, that comes with the whole thing. 
If the work is proposing a reflection on pictorial representation in the classical age, then the conventions casually evoked are part of what, be, what is being reflected upon. In other words, in, by the very syntax of the structure, he makes already clear, of this sentence, he makes already clear that there will, won't be much reflection in this whole discussion. There won't be much self-reflection, not much questioning, because it's already established. Searle's, Searle brackets not only Foucault's argument, but also his own opportunity to, uh, to avoid the charge of ahistoricism, rather than saying, this is why it's a cl critically classical work, Classic, classicism becomes something that goes without saying, that's eliminated in the brackets, and we talk about universals. Searle's interest, and I mean this in a specific, almost German sense of interest, his, his stake to do this seems twofold. He wants to safeguard the paradox of the painting as well as the universal validity of the rest of his statement, his theory of meaning. His investment in both is equally strong, obviously, because the existence and the resolution of the former must prove the validity of the latter. It is because this painting is, of course, etc., self-reflexive, that meaning can be what he claims it to be, intentional, based on resemblance, and dependent on point of view. In this sense, his discursive use of Las Meninas is rigorously meta-discursive. It may be situated somewhere between Foucault's overtly illustri illustri illustrative, what do you say? Use, illustrative use of the painting, and let's say a primarily interpretive endeavor where the discourse is really interested in the painting rather than in classicism, for example. Although it's interesting that none of these works, none of these papers that you have read really is on Las Meninas. Steinberg comes the closest, mm -hmm. but they all try to prove a, a point. I'm not criticizing this, but it's just an interesting realization, this mm -hmm. systematic displacement and critical uh, discourse. What would be talking about the painting? Well, uh, let's say talking more about the painting than about um, point of view, representation, classicism, all these issues that they bring up. Schneider and Cohen talk about what is point of view in the visual sense. And Searle talks about what is meaning. And Foucault talks about what is classicism. And the paintings come in, comes in to prove their case. The points of Searle's argument, which will be explicitly or implicitly challenged, are already inscribed, I mean in the next next vague of debate are already inscribed in this syntactic structure to begin with the paradox itself. Snyder and Cohen will passionately attack Searle's account of point of view and I'm not saying they are wrong, I'm saying they are do doing it in a very passionate way. While Alpers, on a different mode, and that's because of the three years between them probably, will challenge the unification to come of the self-reflexivity that the sentence that I just quoted prolept proleptically signifies. And my argument will be that it's the fact that so Searle's discourse is structured this way that you get as a desire to contradict him because he is he's not playing fair. You get a sense that there's it's reflecting already what he's going to say, though, so there is a kind of obsessive repetitiveness in the discourse. While the two monodisciplinary art historians, I, at least I, th I assume they are, Snyder and Cohen, I'm not sure. One is a philosopher. One is a photographer. Okay, that, that is interesting. Well, th these two guys, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> respond emotionally to the philosopher's intrusion in their fields, and that's why I assumed they were straight art historians. Alpers, who is known for her involvement in interdisciplinary discussions on representations, she is the creator of that journal Representation that comes out of Berkeley and that is about verbal and visual art. That is, somebody asked the question if this, this seminar stands in, in, in a school. And I, you could think that representations is the first symptom of this development. Because when a journal comes up, you have a new field, right? That's almost the the argument to say there is a new field. Anyway, Albers addresses precisely the limitations 
of art historical discourse. And that's interesting. He was an art historian with interdisciplinary interests. So Foucault as a philosopher comes as an outsider, makes mistake, mistakes, and gets devastated by insiders. But then there are two art historians who are, uh, let's say, self-confident as art historians who can afford to do a better job because they have also interdisciplinary interests. This is just a little plea for interdisciplinarity. The proleptic predetermination of this con of Searle's conclusion is so decisive that the philosopher will need to accumulate fallacy on fallacy to lay out his view. Here is, for example, the realist fallacy. It is the first painting, as far as I know, to be painted. With, it is the first painting to do something. It's also a, uh, an, a, an ahistorical statement under the guise of a historical one. It's saying that this, this, could, this could be saying here's the beginning of a historical period, but it's most often saying this is a unique work. It is the first painting, as far as I know, to be painted from the point of view of the model and not from that of the artist. Now, this is the realist fallacy. The two assumptions that are bothering in the statement point precisely at the problematic aspects of the theory Searle bases his argument on. Firstly, the statement implies the distinction of model and painter, which ruled out, rules out of consideration the self-portrait, as we have here. I'm sorry, we're still looking at the Rembrandt. Maybe we should looking at, be looking at the Velasquez again, but where is the Velasquez? Well, this genre offers the most powerful occasion for self-reflection. I mean, we present the self-portrait as, of course, a very strong occasion, and we will talk about the self-portrait. Rather than claiming that the model, assumed to be the king and queen of, of Spain, has to be other than the viewer, it would, because that's what he's saying. He says there is no place for the viewer. And that assumes that that's not us, and maybe it is us. I mean, why would you assume that a priori? It would be worthwhile to explore the possibility that the two are identified, the viewer and the royal cover. Secondly, the conflation of model and representative figure, and that is the worst of the two, that's a real fallacy, boils down to a denial of the representational status of the work. That is, he's actually claiming that the, the two people stand there, the real people, the model. A denial that leaves little room for self-reflection. That is, regardless of the previously mentioned possibility of identification between viewer and king and queen, the fact that it is a mirror that is represented does not mean that we have to fall into the trap of the mirror. That is almost, I would say, it's true that the mirror is here what poses the question, but it also poses the question of itself as a mode of representation. That is, maybe mirroring is also not mirroring. It can be, for example, a metaphorical mirror, suggesting precisely self-reflection in the discursive sense, well, by the metaphor of the visual sense. At first sight, the statement might enjoy the benefit of, the of a possibly fruitful doubt. That is, the statement by Searle, the first painting painted from the point of view of the model and not from the artist. So he's really bringing in the real people. But we can, it can be meant ambiguously, this word model. That is, it could be the model that this represented painter is working on, with, rather than the real people who are in the mirror. But that is not what he means. Is Searle speaking of the royal pair as really present at the invisible side of the room, as present as the viewer, or as the model of the represented painting scene? that is, this narrative that's interrupted. Such a reading of the statement would have a truly self-reflexive potential because then, then you would really get dizzy about all the possibilities involving the viewer, Searle, in the breaking down of the work's unity. But that is not what happens. The description of the painting precludes such a reading of the sentence and points to the contrary to a generalizing statement almost comparable to Thomas Mann's ironic statement about Joseph's beauty being the most, you know, remember Joseph the most beautiful of all times in all in, in his world and the little knives. But uh, of course, I'm now being a little nasty about Cyril. And I, I, before I forget, I really must tell you that this is not to put Cyril down or Snyder and Cohen. I make, I'm, I'm not trying to poke fun at these particular people, but um, 
I want to do some self-reflection and I, you'll see next week that I will also not exclude myself from it. The analysis relies heavily on the conflation of model and representation, which turns the discussion into a realist endeavor. This third whole argument can stand or falls not with point of view, as Snyder and Cohen say, because then Steinberg comes in and is right to say it accommodates both, but it stands and falls with realism. Here we can begin to see how Rembrandt's panel can serve as another intertext to the Velasquez. We can now assign one possible meaning to the apparently clumsy pose of Rembrandt's represented self. It's clearly not a very lively little man there. And in the same move overcomes Searle's fallacy. The self-portrait is thus emphatically proposed as a portrait, as a non-narrative whose as a non-narrative portrait whose generic conventions contradict those of the studio narrative, which is equally emphatically represented in Las Meninas. If you, if you really, if you compare, here you have this stillness of the pose compared to this liveliness of the pose. There's also posing, but they are posing somehow for real. To quote ironically this, this uh, realistic thing. Comparative. The, comparatively, the Rembrandt is almost a still life, I would claim, in an ironic sense, because he's alive, it's alive, but it's, it's turning him into an apple and, 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 and grapes, right, on, on the table. The palette on the wall, and I really have more arguments than, that, than just, because this painting, of course, has been criticized as clumsy and early work. It is one of his earliest work, and I'm not saying that it's great. But I'm saying that the, the stillness of the pose has meaning, or can have meaning. The palette on the wall, the distance between painter and canvas, the pencil or brush still pointing elsewhere. The brush he's having in his hand is not pointing to the work. He's not ready to set out to paint. The, pa the palette on the wall is empty and it's hanging. It all denotes that the painter is not at work. That is, not yet. These details comment on the distance in Las Meninas between painter and canvas. Now, do I go? Yes. Between painter and canvas, emphasized by the interposition of the serpent offering the princess a drink to which I shall return. This girl is standing between the painter and the canvas. In other words, here too, there is an emph emphasis on the distance between the, the man and his work. We cannot ignore now that Velasquez's painter, that Velasquez's painter's pose is also just a little too much arrested to be a plausible artist at work. And that's why I, I showed this parade of details in the beginning that you really saw. This is a self-portrait, this is not a narrative. Granted, Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's work is on, the, on one level just an early work, and it is easy, and too easy to my taste, to attribute the stiff pose to real clumsiness. I mean, you can always do that, but then you don't talk about it. What, but what if this early date is appropriated into the interpretation? That is, if you can give the work meaning, include it, the fact that it's an early work. And what if, by the time he did this work, the artist has already painted dynamic narrative works? I mean, this is not his very first, and he has done better in terms of narrative of narrativity. Moreover, the charge of clumsiness does not fit the sense of daring play with proportion and light. We were on the Rembrandt now, right? Okay. There is a daring play with light, and it's the kind of play with light that made him famous. Rather, the represented artist is represented, presented as a construction. And the self-reflexivity of the work needs the awareness of this construction in order to make its complex arguments. No conflation between the model, that is the real artist, but posing as the constructed artist, and represent. It is unfortunate that Searle turns out to be trapped by his own paradox and thereby seems to make a convincing case for realism as the most powerful mode of reading, powerful enough to undermine the explicit self-reflexive effort. For not only his own discourse, but also the painting he is sub subduing in it is infected by the realistic fallacy. The turn is fortunate, however, to the extent that it demonstrates, I would almost say visually, 
in any case, self-reflexively, -reflex in the specular sense, it shows us, like the distinction showing and telling, right? It shows rather than tells us. Through the visual dimension of syntactic, syntactic structure, for example, the power of a self-reflexive painting to absorb the position of the viewer to the point of paralyzing the latter's ability of self-reflection. The realist turn of argument is fortunate then because it is rooted in the very mirroring that makes the painting self-reflexive and thus helps us see helps us see in Mitchell's fourth sense, I'm, I'm referring here to the categories of Mitchell, syntactic as visual in the sense of structure and, and then this fourth sense of insight as visual. What self-reflection can do? The mirror image of the royal couple, the key to the work's problematic status to which all the art critics are hooked, mirrors itself. It is not only the mirror of the real viewer of the scene, that is, the, the king and queen walking into the room and seeing this scene, of the viewer's intrusion upon the scene, of the invisible work on the canvas and of the visuality of that work, but because it mirrors all these. It mirrors its own status as mirror. It stands for mirroring. Hence, it is the mise en abîme of self-reflection. I really think that little mirror is interesting and, and everybody is hooked to it because it stands for self-reflection. But it also makes it really difficult to do self-reflection. Thus it includes into its nauseating specularity the social aspects of painting in the historical age it positions itself in, the interdependence of opposed classes, the fact that the, they are there on the mode of a portrait questions the distinction between the painting and the mirror that at the outset are the distinction between art and nature and art and truth, etc. And it's absolutely, it is one among many paintings. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, you have that French book there? No, it's just the mm -hmm. Yeah, I recognize the book, but I, I don't don't have, I don't recall that information. But it's interesting. If it is clearly a mirror, it must kill the image of self, and that's precisely the point. More than to know who these are, and thereby it identifies the royal masters, narratively intruding, and the painting servant engaged in self-reflection to one another, because we have here a mirror, and we have here a self-portrait, and self-portraits are done in a mirror. There's no other way to do a self-portrait. This seems an appropriate moment to ask how Rembrandt's panel works self-reflection in into itself, in spite of the absence of the mirror, or for that matter, of any character other than himself. Hence of the difference between classes that Velasquez manages so masterfully to integrate in the question of representation. The self-portrait takes on a novel meaning in this respect. Firstly, it is a genre that accommodates many endeavors. Using the cheapest available model, it serves the purposes of study. And as such, it is one way among many in which the self-portrait enhances the representation of work. Because in a way it is study, and what is study? Uh, study is the work of representation, how to do representation. The self-portrait is self-reflexive not only because it shows us the face we know to belong to the painter, but because it stands for study, for the practice of painting and its difficulties. Secondly, it is a genre based on the mirror image. Only by watching his own face in the mirror is the artist able to represent it. Yet such a representation is always dubious as a natural image, as the perfect copy. And that is exactly what the work with self, uh, the self-portrait in Rembrandt shows. Representing the mirror with the self-portrait is one way of foregrounding the double-sidedness of self-reflection, which is implied through the implied mirror in self-portrait as a genre. 
And that's not what Rembrandt's doing. That's what Velasquez is doing. But in Rembrandt's pen panel, the mirror is not represented. Has the painter erased it in order to promote the idea of transparent realistic representation? That is unlikely. Many of Rembrandt's self-portraits without mirror are significantly explicit on the representational aspects of the work. And next week we will see one of those. Either he ostentatiously explores the face as in a set of early etchings that I hope you have seen sometimes. They're all, I, I didn't have the slides right in, uh, ready in time, but there are all, all these self-portraits etchings where he, he makes the most impossible faces. Like, like, a theater, like an actor trying to rehearse several roles. Or as in the impressive self-portrait in the Frick collection, where he appropriates royal status by posture, but also by dress, this enormous thing that is also hung a little high so that you are impressed also by its position. Or he has this, this yellow robe and a scepter, a scepter? scepter, scepter, where he really poses as a king and the dress foregrounds the constructive aspects of the costume. We will talk about the way in which narcissism, in the strictest sense, is at issue in these works. And the one self-portrait that I showed you in the beginning is, is, a, is a case where you can clearly see how narcissism, self-reflection, study, paint, representation are combined, intertwined. In the Boston panel, this one, the erasure of the mirror as device of self-reflection is not quite at stake either. The mirror is inscribed, albeit negatively, in the painting in two complementary ways. There is the palette hung in the place of the mirror, as tiny proportionally as Velasquez's mirror. It has the same place. The palette is empty and thus proleptic, introducing time and suspense. That is, you ask, since we know that Rembrandt is this great painter, although he didn't know that when he was doing this work. You ask, what, what's the next stage in this development? Its emptiness is made visible, illuminated by the amazing source of light this painting works with. The light coming from the invisible canvas, and that is emphasized by that, that stripe, that line of the sight that kind, kind of shows an emptiness. The canvas thus substitutes the idea of the lamp to that of the mirror, in the sense of Abrams, the mirror and the lamp. But this is not as clearly a substitution as the ambiguity of the keyword reflection shows, because there's two meanings. If the canvas reflects light, then we are led to assume that it is empty itself, as if, like Velasquez's mirror, is convincingly argued by Steinberg to do. The palette mirror reflects the painting that we cannot see. Then the canvas is arguably empty, but then it's also mirroring. Then a, the, a mirroring connection is established between the palette and the, and the empty canvas. But we have to account for one other detail in relation to this emptiness, the look of the represented painter. I don't have a detail, but I can guarantee you I've been with a magnifying glass at the museum. The man is looking at the viewer, but his eyes are not focused. They're just two holes. The man, um, it's like hollow black blots, holes, which may also be looking obliquely at the canvas. That's that sense that the canvas is standing between him and us. It makes you a little insecure about what he's looking at. Significantly, the reason why we cannot be quite sure of the latter possibility lies in the line of light. Although it is fully illuminating the empty palette, the canvas that does not quite illuminate the artist's face. You see that the light stops right under his eyes. And this is typical of his later work. His light will always be just a little displaced compared to what you expect, to the, to the focus, to the central thing that makes you look for it more detail than you get. A triangle emerges from this difficulty between the canvas, the artist, and the viewer. This triangle introduces the complexity that justifies the comparison with Las Meninas. The tension in the work stems from this problem. Who dominates and thus defines, in the Hegelian sense, whom? The painter is represented looking at the viewer, who thus becomes the model of a self-portrait, a situation at least as paradoxical as the mirror wherein the royalties stand in for the viewer. You see that there is, in both cases, the place is taken. 
if Searle's identification, admittedly based on the technical error, and Brent, Snyder, and Cohen, that they are not wrong, technically speaking, but as Steinberg argues, nonetheless plausible. I mean, we tend to think, I'm sorry, we are in the other page. No. Oh, I'm so sorry. OK, I start my sentence again. If Searle's identification between the royal pair and the viewer, admittedly based on a technical error, but as Steinberg argues, nonetheless plausible, of the viewer with the king and queen of Spain introduces a slightly embarrassing narcissism in the act of viewing. That is, nar uh, viewing becomes a royal act. Something even more embarrassing threatens to happen with the Rembrandt. The viewer is led to identify with the painter who has not yet painting, painted anything, but who is posing as the great painter, which is paradoxical in itself, and he also represents that he hasn't started yet. There is a kind of pride in posing as a painter, defined as he, as he is by the size of his work. This is this, the great work, literally, that he's going to do. And there are promises to be literally, literally a great man. This identification is more embarrassing because it's not so much a transgression of class boundaries, although it's also that, given Rembrandt's claim for the royalty of painting. Rembrandt was a lower class person who moved up through painting and through marriage, by the way, but that's another case. But it is primarily and directly a transgression of subjective boundaries and the irreducible opposition between I and you. It allows the threat of collapse inherent in what Benveniste held as C as the personal language situation, with its inevitable role reversals, a threat which makes representation of otherness, the distancing mode of the third person, such an urgent impulse, that is, the IU is threatens to collapse because you have constantly to switch to the other position, while the third person style mode allows you to objectify the other, and that's one of the reasons why that's so attractive. And of course, third person is then in painting the absence of the viewer, and the absence of the you and the absence of the I. The transgression suggested in the identification of viewer with painter thus instills in the act of viewing a sense of regression to the imaginary stage, limited by the experience of the mirror and its alienating effect. There is this identification with the mirror image that is somebody else, as Lacan explains. Rather than trying to escape this troubling effect by deflecting it towards criticism of the painter's clumsiness, the artificial pose can be allowed to enhance this alienating effect. He stands there for us to identify with him, and if we feel bad about that and embarrassed, that's precisely the point. What does this reflection on and of the Rembrandt allow us to say about Searle's blissful realism. By stepping into the realist fallacy, by moving inside, not through the looking glass, which the work so deceptively proposes for reflection, Searle necessarily blinds himself to the critical function of the mirror, which proposes reflection on boundaries of class, but also more profoundly on the boundaries of self and self-definition. It is as if the need for realism has something to do with this. It allows us, and the critic, to be enthusiastic about self-reflection while totally escaping its threatening, because self-questioning, effect of the mirror. In order to, mirror, um, to measure, can you still hold on for a few pages? In order to measure this blindness, we must take the argument two steps further. We almost do. One step involves the verbality of Searle's response and his investment in and denial of it. Let's have the... the oh, no. I'm sorry, this is not my fault. It is just not doing what I want it to do. Okay. The other... One step involves the verbality of Searle's response and his investment in and denial of it. The other involves the consequences of the tension thus produced between verbal and visual and non-reflective and self-conscious intermedial in, uh, transactions. Searle relates the status of his paradox to realism with reference to contemporary treatises on art 
but not before first positing the realist standard as his own by his theory of meaning, thus operating unwittedly the identification with the artist's dubiously unstable position he tries so effectively to escape at another level. See, by, by stating in brackets that this is obviously the classical way of representation, and then also stating in brackets that meaning is realistic as a pre-given, he's conflating himself and the painter. We know, he was here so towards the end of his article, we know that the paradoxes must have a simple solution because we know that the scene depicted is a visually possible scene. Now, what kind of an argument is this if you think about it? Not the painting itself becomes the measure of its own possibility, but the scene, and this is again the story about the model, right? The scene it proposes as depicted, hence depictable. The total submission consists of taking the painting, as it were, at its word. Visual evidence is privileged in a positivistic turn of mind. We can see it so it's there, right? That's the argument. Taking the picture for proof of itself, the self-reflection is turned into self-non-reflection. Rather than taking the word to question itself, it is alleged to affirm itself without, I mean, he in fact eliminates reflection in any possible sense. This realism in turn makes the solution to the paradoxes simple, unified, that is, and, and as we will see, verbal. Again, the desirability and the possibility of the solution are implicated rather than stated in the syntax of the sentence. Although the self-evidencing effect of the painting is referred to in its visuality, is referred to its visuality, the solution, because he says we can see that it's there, the solution to the paradox proposed by So is not surprisingly linguistic. Drawing upon speech act theory, you know that Searle is one of the big guys in speech act theory. Searle proposes the following shockingly simple solution. I quote a little longer quote here. Just as every picture contains an implicit I see, so according to Kant, every mental representation contains an implicit I think. And according to speech act theory, every speech act can be accompanied by an explicit performative, for example, I say. But just as in thought, the I of the I think need not be that of the self, in fantasy, for example. And in speech act, the I of the I say need not be that of the speaker or writer. Now, here's the interesting example. In ghost writing, for example, so in the Las Meninas, the I of the I see is not that of the painter, but of the royal couple. Now, I think this is the best example of the fallacies of speech act theory itself. Rather than asking the obvious question of seeing, if seeing, thinking, and speaking can be thus seen as identical in structure, I want to address the symptomatic choice of example first. The example given in I think, fantasy, is problematic. The one given for I say is highly surprising. Rather than citing the obvious and relevant but problematic cases of third person and first person narrative, and with the quotation marks that you know from the ontology that I would like to apply here, the unlikely, irrelevant, and hardly illuminating case of ghostwriting comes up to argue that the I can be different from the speaker. In ghostwriting, the speech act does precisely that. It performs the identification of one speaker, the subject of the utterance, as someone he or she is not, but chooses or has to choose to be for the time of the utterance. And I think of Colette here being locked up in her study to write 10 pages before lunch break for her husband. That doesn't mean that it's not she who is writing. The reason why different narrative structures are most problematic as well as more relevant is precisely that sheer subject identity is not assumed but challenged in these modes of narrative. That is, why the com that is why the comparison between Rembrandt's panel and the Velasquez can help us to understand the issues. If first person, in first-person narrative, I guess we can, it's better to go now to the Rembrandt. In first-person narrative, the speaker shifts within an unchanging identity between the subject positions that that identity can variously occupy. Marcel in Proust à la Recherche as the adult writing writer, linguistically indistinguishable, yet representationally radically different from the young boy experiencing the anxiety produced by his mother's uncertain availability, for example, this opening scene of 
long time she must be crocheted by now. The adolescent, exploring social and sexual roles. Even the adult, thinking writer, is self-reflexively worried about the endeavor he is involved in, and it's that doubleness that makes the work interesting. This in another sense, this is another sense in which, sense in which the stiff pose of the Rembrandt's painter is meaningful. It is a self-portrait that foregrounds its own constructedness in order to challenge the identity itself. In order to solve this theoretical problem, speech act theory has had to set up a set of characters doing things under the heading of speech that are quite different from it, looking for example, or thinking. And there is a book by uh, Edmond Dupont where he really talks about characters, when in fact he means this difference between narrator and vocalization that I think is a much more uh, comfortable term because it implies also the embedding of the one and the other. So there is the possibility of identification of identity and separation of function. Well, he really sets up characters, and you can read it, and it looks like there is the hero, the speaker, and then there is that other person who is ironically of the opposite view, etc. Third-person narrative, on the other hand, is a concept paradoxical in itself because it leads to the absurd identification of the third-person narrator, uh, narrator as impossible and as ideological as the perfect copy and the idea of the omniscient narrator, which means God, is of course a good case. The perfect copy of the world assumed to be the goal of realistic painting, and I think that this, this has a lot to do with one another. The fact that Searle, as an acknowledged voice in the school of speech act theory, fails to examine the implicit parallel, parallels with these forms of narration is a significant gesture of repression, and even more so if you realize that he's at Berkeley and that Anne Bell and Benfield is his near his close colleague and has has worked on this forever. The way Rembrandt, as Alpes argues, makes value out of his face, thus promoting the construction of something like a genre of non-autographic self-portraits. There is this whole even today there are still people doing this, doing Rembrandt self-portraits. There have been Rembrandt self-portraits, which sold very well, no, admittedly, by other, other hands. That, that became a genre. That's already relevant for this early work. The self-portrait hovers between self and other, challenging the distinction between the categories of first and third person, as it challenges subjectivity and its illusion of wholeness. The fallacious concept of a third-person narrative is effectively absorbed by speech act theory, by the analogy to the Kantian thinking subject, the assumption of an implicit I say, and that an implicit I say is identical to the I think. The problem that remains, however, is the one that also remains in first person narrative, to which it is now theoretically identical, the possibility to represent within the speaking voice of the now safeguarded unified narrator, narrator the views, thoughts, and misconceptions or conceptions of other subjects. These subjects, for whom narratology has devised the term vocalization or focalizes, can be embedded characters whose point of view the narratorial voice adopts and even in free and direct discourse absorbs to the point of confusion, but also the diffused ideologies or doxas that the speaking subject would like to disavow, as well as the speaker's unconscious views fantasies and preoccupations to see what the implications are of this theory. This is again foregrounded in Rembrandt's little man, who is both self and other, in relation to our image of the artist, as well as in relation to ourselves. He literally mediates, sees for us what we cannot see. But since we are reflected in and by him, our emptiness can be filled with his narcissistic fantasies about grandeur which, likely enough, we all share. This is a painting about ambition, and that is an attractive subject for us to look at. The central device for this confusion, the painter's eyes, backfires nicely on the viewer. Although the artist can see the work to come, he can see the canvas, but he can also mentally, in Mitch's sense, see what will be represented on it. His hollow eyes need our eyes to see 
to acknowledge the status of this beginning artist that we identify with. That is, we have to say, oh, right, this is Rembrandt at the beginning of his great career. This is going to be a great man. We know the answer that he doesn't know, right? And this is how I meant that the date of the painting has some relevance. This issue leads to the second next step. The introduction of a speech act theory based solution to the problem, which as we may now want to say, was speech act based from the beginning, rests on the assumed analogy between seeing and speaking, an analogy which is, I'm afraid, untenable. It is so for two reasons. It conflates different modes of perception without examining the implications of that conflation, and it conflates different subject positions in relation to the acts of these different modes of perspective. Uh, of perception. Establishing, I'm almost through, two more minutes, establishing an analogy between I see and I think and I say is not the same thing as criticizing and undermining an unwarranted opposition between two media. I mean, I'm not trying to say that he should be, we should agree with him because at least he's not buying into this opposition. It is, to the contrary, obscuring the issues involved in such a critique. As a consequence, it enables so to account for a visual paradox in a fundamentally verbal way, while, as we have seen, bracketing crucial problems with reference to the reliability of seeing on which we must rely, that is the positivism that comes in. Ultimately, the argument is just we see it, so it's there. The conflation is mediated, rendered invisible by the interposition of thinking. He says, seeing, thinking, speaking. And thinking is a mode of semiosis without clearly defined medium. Could be either, right? It's, it's exactly in the middle. That mediation also allows the other conflation that between acts of production and acts of reception to pass unnoticed. This is the IU conflation of the personal language situation in Benveniste's sense. The an analogous act to speaking would be painting, not seeing the result of painting. And the act analogous, or analogous, how do you say this? Analogous. analogous. <laughs> the act analogous to visually representing something out there, like a scene in the Velasquez, this idea that there is a scene that we intrude upon, would be third person narration. Thus, so represses the verbal aspects of his response also by repressing his own position as the viewer that is on the side of reception. You see this point that speaking and thinking is production while seeing is reception in the sense he uses it. The conflation between painting and viewing demonstrates the absorption of the critic in the work in the work, who thus again paradoxically makes himself more important by denying his own position. That is, he's in fact identified with the painter, right as we do in this one. He conflates what Las Meninas exemplarily distinguishes. Maybe get back once more to Las Meninas, the master and the servant, whose interdependence can only be assessed as long as a minimum of autonomy is preserved for each, and that's how dialectic works. Right? Dialectic is not the same thing as conflation. Rembrandt has show, shown why this is such an attractive position, but in fact a non-position. In spite of the narcissistic lack of self, such a conflating entails identification with the artist gratifies narcissistic dreams of grandeur. Interestingly, Snyder and Cohen prove sensitive to this impulse and push the confusion further, although they are trying to be antagonistic, by identifying in their turn with Searle, their official enemy. They take position against him and there they go. They are just in the same thing. The analogy that might have illuminated the issue by demonstrating the verbality of the response is the one between representation, discursive and visual, by the work, and representation, discursive and visual, by the critic. This analogy, analogy seems quite gratifying, but it's much less so because it entails precisely the threat of self-reflection and the loss of self that comes in there. Hence, it is, an, it is overwritten by that other one that obscures it. And I'm well aware that my language here is very visual. But there is this overriding of the threat of identification by another identification that is more gratifying. 
right? Now, what I want to do, I, I'm going to stop here because uh, it's, it's about time. What I want to do next is um, see how this paper paradox lost by Snyder and Cohen is really about paradise lost. And, and that will lead us to back to narcissism and then I will come back on a number of things that I've been doing myself in this seminar. And I will, so I will end with the, the discussion of narcissism and then ask the question why I didn't pick up Milena's point about the neighbor. Right? <laughs> I think you deserve that recognition. <laughs>